If you guys actually saw how I dress on the lower half, I'm not quite sure you would still watch my videos. Business in the front, pyjamas in the back, oh yes. Hey there guys, my name's Megan if you're new here and if not, welcome back for another terrifying episode of Killer Weekend, where each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. If you like all things true crime, UFO, supernatural, conspiracy theory and all that good stuff in between, then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you every weekend with our true crime killer weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our weird old Wednesdays where we'll discuss something spooky I've heard. I will leave a small disclaimer, not quite a small disclaimer, a massive disclaimer. This episode involves details of violent and sexual crime. If that's a trigger point for you, then please feel free to turn away now. Hey my wee freaks, how's life? How are you feeling? Only a few more weeks till crimbo. Holidays are coming, oh it's Coca Cola. Except tonight, it's Diet I Am Brew. That's how I always know it's close to Christmas when the Christmas Coca Cola ad strolls onto my TV. What about you? What's your favourite part of the Christmas season? For me, understandably, with my double chin, it's the food. Not my own food, of course. The food that my mum cooks for me so she can have her mental breakdown in the kitchen and I just reap the benefits. The worst part I would say is the present anxiety. You guys can actually let me know if it's just my weirdo family who are like this because my aunts actually really like this too. So you go over to say your boyfriend's house or your friend's house, not someone in your immediate family, and they hand you a gift. And they expect you to open that gift in front of them. So then everyone's watching, thinking, will she like the gift? Won't she like the gift? Someone's random uncle is usually dressed like Santa and suddenly have a whole family of people watching you open this present. It's such an awkward time. You're sitting there pretending, oh, I wonder what it is, when all you want at that moment in time is to go into a room and open your gift privately. Is that just me? Is that just us? Or does anyone else get present anxiety? I went on a bit of a tangent there, but anywho, speaking of Christmas and the festive period, I'm sure that we all want to be looking our best this Christmas season, whether that's to avoid your mother's insults about another bad haircut, or whether it's to seduce Dan from marketing into a drunken Christmas winch at the office party. Whatever your Christmas plans, I'm sure we all have that coveted appointment booked in with our hairdresser. Fun fact guys, my mum is actually a hairdresser, so for that reason, me and my sister were practically raised in her salon. I used to love it when I was a wee girl, I would get to sit in one of those spinny chairs and just watch as people came in, drab, lifeless, just not feeling very good about themselves, and then they'd leave looking like a new woman. And we need to touch on the gossip, okay, because I'd be lying if I said that was not the best part about being in a hair salon. You hear everything. Because of the nature of that business, a lot of people felt like they knew my mum, they knew my family, they would pop in with treats and cakes at Christmas time, lots of bottles of Prosecco, seriously, you should see us on Christmas day, it gets quite messy. But because you are so exposed to the public in this industry, it would often bring in a few unwanted characters, people who my mum never knew but believed that they knew her. Sometimes someone would see a group of young women working alone and instead of seeing a friend, they saw their prey. Tonight everyone, we will be discussing the almost unsolved murder of Dana Satterfield. It was July 31st in 1995 in Roebuck, South Carolina. This was local hairstylist Dana Satterfield's late night. What salon owners will do is they will have one night of the week that they open past 5pm so that people who work Monday to Friday 9 till 5 still have an opportunity to come in after their shift and get their hair done. So because of this, Dana was working past 8pm. The shop which was named the Roebuck Hair and Tanning centre was situated along the highway in an old converted trailer. Now despite it being a little bit out of the way, there was a few other shops along the same street so salon owner Dana Satterfield never really felt isolated when she was working alone. She felt safe but sadly 
she wasn't. At around 10 past 8 p.m. that evening, a woman who was selling cleaning products door to door knocked on Dana's door and Dana, being the loving and generous person she always was, bought some products from the woman and off she went. As the sun set in Roebuck that evening, Dana finished up the last few of her clients and being the chatty Cathy that she always was, Dana began to talk to her clients about her own life. But at that point in time, Dana was harboring a secret. Dana had always been unlucky in love and to look at her, she's tiny, petite, blonde, gorgeous, every man's dream. And you think to yourself, how could she struggle to find a man? But she did, she just hadn't met her soulmate yet. Whilst in high school, a young Dana believed that she had met the one, as I'm sure all of us naive people do at one point or another. Your mum usually hates them, you know the one. But despite their best efforts, the young couple couldn't keep it together. And after they were married and had a young daughter named Ashley Arrowwood after graduation, the marriage soon fell apart and Dana found herself at the age of 18 alone, a single mother. Here she was, this young teenage girl with this little baby and all she wanted was a strong family unit. She wanted to find love. And then, as if from the heavens someone answered her prayers, came along Mike Satterfield. Dana and Mike were the embodiment of the phrase opposites attract. Seriously. He was this massive, huge dude, like big dude, horizontally, and vertically and Dana was this tiny little petite blonde absolutely gorgeous but for them it worked Dana loved Mike and he certainly loved her back Dana and Mike would soon be married after they met and they extended their family with a little boy named Brandon and despite the fact that Ashley wasn't Mike's biological daughter he treated she and Brandon exactly the same family meant everything to Mike Satterfield and also so did his own business that he ran. He ran a business in heating and air conditioning and this was actually quite successful locally. Mike took pride in being the family's breadwinner whilst Dana would work here and there freelance just to make a little bit of extra money. She enjoyed raising the children but when they were old enough she was itching to get out there and start her very own business. She wanted to leave a legacy that her children could be proud of. Her husband husband couldn't have been more supportive of those dreams. She wanted to build her very own hair salon from the ground up and he was willing to help her do that. He even helped her convert this beaten down old little trailer on the sides of the road into her dream salon. Mike, using his skills from his own company, would even fit the water heater that Dana would use in her shop. But sadly for these two, the wedded bliss wouldn't last. Something was missing and after seven years in 1995, the two decided to legally separate. Mike was quite optimistic about the split. He felt like they just needed a little bit of time apart and Dana would change her mind. But little did he know that Dana had actually booked herself in with a divorce lawyer for later that week. Despite the split, Dana's friends would say that they were very amicable for exes. I know that's not the case with a lot of people. So on the night of the 31st of July, 1995, Dana was just trying to kind of throw herself into work. She was going through quite a turbulent time personally. And you know what it's like when you're going through a really stressful time, you just want to get your mind off it. At around 8.30 p.m. that evening, the time that Dana would normally be mopping the floors and getting ready to go home, the woman who sold her the cleaning supplies earlier that day, and just for reference, I've heard her called Diane, and also Shirley, but for the intents and purposes of this video, I'll just call her Shirley. Shirley was actually waiting on her friend to pick her up after a long day of door-to-door -door sales when she saw something unbelievable. Shirley, standing there minding her own beeswax, saw a young, athletically built male jumping from the window of Dana's trailer. Once the man had leapt from the window, he and Shirley had this odd moment of eye contact and the two ran in the opposite direction from each other. Little did Shirley know as she made her way around to a local liquor store to call law enforcement, she actually had ran the same way as the killer, just in different directions. When the saleswoman had almost reached the front door of the liquor store, she was stopped in her tracks because there 
standing across the car park, staring at her with a clenched fist, was the man she had just seen leave the salon. Would this stranger come for Shirley now she'd seen his face? She sure thought so. Looking at the man, he was of an athletic build. She did not stand a chance. If Shirley had ran, he would have surely caught up to her in seconds. What was she supposed to do? As all these thoughts are racing through her panicked mind, the man runs. Only later in this case would Shirley realise how lucky she had been as she just had a face off with a killer. Determined to call the local police, Shirley ran to a row of homes just behind the liquor store and began banging on people's doors, asking them to call 911, asking them for help. I've spoken about this several times. Maybe it means I'm gonna burn in hell, but I wouldn't answer the door if that was me. I mean, I won't even answer the door to the Amazon delivery driver at this point. I'm not a monster. Of course I'd happily call police just from the safety of my locked house. As this call had initially come in as what they believed to be a burglary, they sent a uniformed officer over to the scene. Now this man actually knew of Dana and Mike and when he got there, he knew something was wrong. At first he saw the screen that had been knocked out of the window and this is the window that Shirley claimed that someone had jumped out of. He also noticed that the front door was left ajar and all of the lights were off in the salon, something that Dana would never have done. There was so much expensive equipment in there, she wouldn't have just left the door lying wide open. I mean, I know small town people are trusting, but Jesus. As he entered the trailer, everything seemed normal. However, as he made his way towards the back of the salon, nothing could prepare him for what he was about to find. Propped against the salon's water heater was 27-year-old Dana Satterfield. The young mum had been savagely beaten and as she was found nude from the waist down, it was assumed that this crime was sexually motivated. Dana's cause of death was determined as asphyxiation due to strangulation. She had been choked by a duffel bag strap and left suspended from the water heater. Feeding the killer was still in the local area. Backup was called and investigators arrived on the crime scene. Several things were noted by law enforcement when they arrived at the salon, one being the window. It was very strange that Shirley had saw someone literally leap out of that window when the front door to the salon was left ajar. Why would someone go to the trouble of doing that? Also, let's remember this was initially considered a robbery, but nothing was taken, none of the expensive equipment had been stolen, and no cash had been taken from the register that day. The killer, according to investigators, had apparently left a wealth of DNA evidence or so it seemed. There was a fingerprint on the water heater that investigators were certain happened during the killing. They believed that the killer had leaned on the water heater whilst they murdered Dana for support. There was also male DNA found on Dana's body, which they believe was left during the sexual assault. So I'm sure we're all thinking slam dunk, right? You're wrong because this was 1995 y'all. At this point in time, DNA testing was in its infancy. It was a tiny little baby. We also didn't have the databases that we have today, such as CODIS, which came about in 1998, and APHIS, which came in 1999. So, even if they did have a fingerprint and the DNA of the killer, this wasn't as easy as running it through a check system, no. They had to create a list of suspects and then exonerate the suspects only if they were willing to give their DNA and fingerprints. Because legally, unless they have solid evidence, there's no way they're getting a warrant for someone's DNA. Let's be honest, how many killers do you know that would be like, please take my DNA on a platter? One thing I will say is the investigators had great foresight to actually take the DNA from the crime scene and preserve it properly. Actually doing their jobs, well done. Us over here in the true crime community know that that's about as rare as a turtleneck at the Playboy Mansion. So what that meant was even though they couldn't get an answer there in 1995, maybe they could get one in the future. However, I don't think investigators could have ever anticipated 
just how long it would be before they got that answer. As the investigation began, things were looking quite positive. The investigators weren't struggling for leads by any means. There is a phrase in the true crime community, such as, it's always the husband. And we're not actually wrong because 61% of female murder victims will be killed by someone that is either a current partner or an ex-partner. So of course, Mike Satterfield was the top of their list. And when they brought Mike in, he wasn't what they were expecting at all. Mike was absolutely heartbroken over the loss of his wife. Also, as we mentioned, Mike was a big dude. So the thought of him trying to get out of this tiny little window, let alone leap from it, was very unlikely. It would kinda be like that scene in Scream where Tatum's trying to get through the wee cat flap in the garage door. One thing that was clear is that Mike and Dana were certainly on different pages concerning their marriage. Mike, as we said, was extremely positive about the fact that they possibly could reconcile, whereas Dana was done. Investigators wondered if Mike realised how Dana felt and thought, if I can't have her, nobody will. But Mike's demeanour wasn't really what you would expect, you know, he was no Chris Watts. He seemed absolutely lost without his wife and now he was left to raise these two children on his own. He never really had much to gain from the loss of his wife and this did leave them scratching their heads. Another thing that was working against investigators is the fact that Mike looked nothing like the man described by Shirley. She said he was young, of an athletic build, he had light brown sandy hair and he had no facial hair. The complete opposite of Mike Satterfield. But there was two circumstances that could explain this away. One, the young man who was seen leaving the salon was actually just an opportunist and when he walked into the scene he realised someone had been murdered and exited through the window in a panic. That could explain why the front door was open and he used the window instead. Possible, but Unlikely. Another explanation could be the fact that Mike never carried out the murder at all and in fact hired someone to do it for him. Mike had quite a solid alibi. He was actually miles away from Dana's salon at the time of the murder, picking up their two children from a friend's house. But investigators thought that he could have possibly paid someone to have his wife killed. There was no paper trail for this at all found. Obviously, you know, dodgy dealings can be done in cash, but there was one thing about the crime scene that investigators just couldn't let go. Remember we spoke about that fingerprint on the water heater just above Dana's head? Well, guess who that belonged to? You don't need to guess because I'll tell you, it's Mike Satterfield's. Was this demeanor of the devastated husband all an act? Not necessarily, because remember, Mike actually fitted the water heater, so it's very possible that he could have left his fingerprint whilst he was putting it in. Sure, the fingerprint, I mean, doesn't look great, does it? But investigators just didn't have that feeling that Mike was their man, unless he was an Oscar-winning actor. It just didn't seem like that was the right fit. But who else could it be? This crime was so up close and personal. This person would have had to stare into Dana's eyes as they took her life from her. Was it a friend? Was it a friend of the family? No one knew. An eyewitness would come forward, later breathing life into this almost cold case. At around 8.40pm on the night of Dana's murder, a suspicious young man fitting the description that Shirley had given to law enforcement was seen standing by a blue and white Ford Bronco. This was around the same time that the killer fled and the Bronco was actually parked out the back next to the salon. Could this possibly have been the killer's getaway car? Please put out a notice to the public for their assistance. Had anyone seen this car? So many people called into the tip line saying that they knew exactly who this car belonged to because of a couple of distinguishing marks on it. 
and they said it belonged to a woman named Mary Ann Vick. When Mary Ann Vick was brought in for questioning, she all of a sudden had a guard up. She was aggressive, she was angry. She said they were harassing her and her family and it came to light that Mary Ann didn't even drive the car, it was her 17 year old son. Jonathan Vick. But weirdly enough, the car wasn't the only thing connecting the Vick family to Dana Satterfield. You see, Mary Ann Vick was actually Dana's hairdressing client. Mary Ann, in the nicest way possible, was known in the hairdressing world as what we call a nightmare. She would come in monthly asking Dana to do some crazy new thing with her hair, and when she was finished, she was never happy. She would often cuss Dana out in front of all her other clients and everyone just got the feeling that she really didn't like Dana. Why keep going back? That's what I say. Do it yourself if you can do a better job. Let's see how that goes. Straight away, the Vic family were behaving very suspiciously. Mary Ann even put a flyer on their car, the Bronco, that was not outside the salon, which said... This is not that Bronco. It has already been checked by police and ruled out. When it hadn't been checked by police and it hadn't been ruled out because she wouldn't let anyone need it. With not much further evidence and none of the Vic family willing to talk, police had to try going down a different avenue. But where? They had no other leads. All leads were pointing to this Bronco. Should police be looking outwards into the community? They had knocked on so many doors with no answers. No one in town could think of someone who would do this to their beloved hairdresser. Roebuck wasn't just a small town where everyone knew everyone's business. They were a community and this is something that made it extremely hard for Dana's family going forward. Even her daughter Ashley said it was a deep-rooted fear for her that she would come into contact with Dana killer on a daily basis. Maybe she'd be waving at him in the street. For years, Dana's murder became a cautionary tale to lock your doors and don't talk to strangers. But could it be possible that someone was just hiding in plain sight? Just when investigators thought they would never solve this case, a new tip came in from a jailhouse confession. Allegedly convicted sex offender Russell Quinn was carrying a picture of Dana and showing it around to other inmates. He would often brag to his roommate that he murdered a hairdresser in Roebuck and Dana certainly fit his victim profile. Police began to get excited about this lead when also the eyewitness, Shirley, who'd sold Dana cleaning products, pointed this man out of a lineup and said that she knew it was him. So off he went, kicking and screaming to have his DNA taken. However, as suspicious as he was acting at the time, when the DNA came back, it wasn't a match. Allegedly, Russell had just been making the whole thing up to seem hard and to prevent other inmates from attacking him because of his crimes against women. Despite all the public appeals, manners put in, and the $50,000 raised, the case unfortunately went cold and no one was coming forward. When suddenly, out of nowhere in 2005, a chance encounter would turn this case from ice cold to red hot. Ashley, then 18, Dana Satterfield's daughter, was taking her car in for a service at the local car garage. While she was there, she met a man named Michael Pace. But when Michael saw Ashley, he thought he'd saw a ghost. He literally felt like it was looking at a picture of Dana Satterfield. But it couldn't be Dana. She was dead and he knew her killer. Later that day, after seeing Ashley, the guilt took over Michael and he went in to the local sheriff's station. And boy, didn't he have a story to tell. Then, age 17 in 1995, Michael and his best friend at the time chatted about girls the way most normal guys do. They were talking about who was the prettiest girl in town and who they would love to ask out, and none was more beautiful than Dana Satterfield. Michael's close friend stated to Michael that he was going to go to Dana's salon that night and ask her out on a date. Now, knowing that he had absolutely no chance of landing 
this 27 year old bombshell, Michael laughed. And when he did, the demeanour changed in the car. His friend was angry, agitated, offended and dropped Michael off on the side of the road, leaving him to drive to Dana's salon in his blue and white Ford Bronco. In the next couple of days, as the news about Dana spread across the television screens, Michael had realised what his friend had done. He confronted him and asked him if this was him that committed this horrific crime. And when he did, his friend threatened that if he opened his mouth, he would be next. Michael couldn't really get rid of the guilt he felt though and over the years he would anonymously call into tip lines giving them his friend's name and it was ignored. There wasn't enough evidence to bring him in for DNA testing so he was left to walk the streets a free man. This would leave us today wondering had this chance encounter between Michael and Ashley not happened at the car garage would we still be wondering who killed Dana Satterfield? And this new line of inquiry would leave Roebuck residents wondering how good a job did their sheriff's department do? Because this man, Michael said was Dana's killer, wasn't a new name. No, it was none other than Jonathan Vic. Remember Jonathan, the weird creepy son who would chill at the back of Dana's salon and just stare at her? Jonathan Vic at this point in time was no boy scout by any means. He was a violent man. He had been arrested several times for domestic abuse charges and not only that, in 2002 he was involved in the disappearance of of another young blonde. Jonathan Vick was dating a young woman named Heather Sellers in 2002. Heather started her shift at the local Waffle House, had a backpack with her so she could change for the evening and had a date later on that night with Jonathan. This would be the last time that Heather was ever seen. One of Jonathan's ex-girlfriends would also later come forward to say that he was extremely violent with her and often would strangle her in arguments. Jonathan and his mummy would deny any involvement in the crime, but you know what they say, hips don't lie and neither does DNA. When Jonathan was approached with a warrant for his DNA, he reluctantly handed it over and guess what, ladies and gentlemen? It was a match. But his mum stayed true to the end and still to this day denies that her boy could have ever done anything so heinous. In fact, many of Jonathan's friends have actually come out later to say that they believe that because of her hatred for Dana, his mother actually helped him cover up his crime. In 2006, Jonathan Vick was found guilty of the rape and murder of Dana Satterfield and he was sentenced to life in prison. Dana's family have kept her memory alive in the best possible way they can. Her young daughter Ashley is a victim's advocate and works for several charities helping families who've been through similar situations. She also talks to inmates in local prisons about the effects that violent crimes have on victims' families. Dana Satterfield was a warm and caring pillar of her community and it's just so tragic and ironic that she was working so hard to create a legacy for her children when in turn it's her children who have left a legacy she would be proud of. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up for me. I also hope that if I've had lipstick on my teeth for this entire episode, you'll be kind in the comments. If you're feeling extra fancy, not sure what that was, but if you are feeling fancy, please hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. My life's pretty boring here in rainy Scotland, but if you would like to see more of it, feel free to follow me. Not home, because that's illegal, on Instagram at Megan True Crime. A big thank you to all of you stunners who watch me every week. Love you. And on that note, lock your doors, don't talk to strangers, and also don't be rude to your hairdresser because next time she messes up your hair, it might not be an accident. You'd be surprised how much shampoo looks like hair removal cream. See ya! <laughs>